Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing with our Trivia Let's Talk Lore series by kicking off part 3 of this trilogy. We ended last part with Cao Cao's defeat at the Battle of Trivi and his escape at Huarong Dao. Today we'll pick up with Cao Cao right after Guan Yu spared his life. As Cao Cao headed westward towards Nanjun, or Jiangling as it's known in the game, he took a head count and counted 27 generals left on horseback and maybe a little over 100 men falling on foot. Almost everyone was injured. It was a sad sight indeed, considering just a day ago, he was dreaming of uniting all of China. Now that dream will have to wait. Soon, as night fell, they ran into another army on the march. But luckily, this time it was Cao Ren, who had come to reinforce after news of the defeat reached Nanjun, where he was originally garrisoned. Cao Ren quickly escorted Cao Cao's group back to Nanjun, and prepared a feast to brighten everyone's mood. Halfway through the feast, however, Cao Cao, who was a little drunk at this time, stood up and started crying to the night sky. And he says, If I still had Guo Jia, then I would not have suffered such a defeat. Then Cao Cao collapsed in tears as everyone tried to comfort him. To provide a little background here, Guo Jia was one of Cao Cao's favorite strategists, but sadly, after Cao Cao defeated Yuan Shao, Guo Jia died of illness at a young age of just 37, just a year before the Battle of Chibi. But regardless, after a full night of rest, Cao Cao returned to his normal self the next day as he made plans to return to the capital. He summons Cao Ren and entrusts him to guard the key port city of Nanjun. As he should expect a lot of pressure from Zhou Yu and Zhuge Liang, Cao Cao leaves him a sealed envelope with a strategy and tells him to use this strategy only when he is in extreme danger. Cao Ren accepts his role to defend Jiangling and asks Cao Cao who will defend the other key southern strongholds in Xiangyang and Hefei. Cao Cao replies, Well, you are technically in charge of the entire Jin province, but I will leave Xia Houdun with an army to garrison in Xiangyang to be your reinforcement in the north. Hefei, on the other hand, is much more important at the moment as Sun Quan has already shown signs of preparing to attack it, so I will send Zhang Liao, Yue Jin, and Li Dian to defend it. So in case you guys are confused on where these locations are on the map, Nanjun is located here, and it's the location of Jiangling Commandery in the game. Xiangyang is the northern inland commandery in the Jin province here, and it's where Liu Bao starts out in the game. Meanwhile, Hefei is all the way in the east. The game really didn't do this famous location justice, as the best proxy for its location is the Yangzhou toolmaker in the game. So the next day, Cao Cao leaves for the capital, and leaves Cao Ren in charge in Nanjun. Cao Ren, wanting to gain better control of the north bank of the Yangtze River, sends Cao Hong, who is a younger cousin to Cao Ren and Cao Cao, farther upstream to another nearby harbor commandery so they have firm control of the crossings on the Yangtze River. Additionally, this also enables them to reinforce each other should one of their commanderies come under a siege. Now before we get into any real fighting here, we also have to see what happened to Guan Yu after letting Cao Cao go. Because if you remember, he swore a military oath on his life before taking up the mission to guard Hua Rongdao. So as he was ambushing at the westernmost point, Guan Yu was the last to get back to Liu Bei. And when he got back, it was already nighttime, and the rest of Liu Bei's group has returned with their halls of spoils of war and were enjoying themselves in a celebratory feast. Seeing Guan Yu enter, Zhuge Liang gets up and congratulates Guan Yu on his historical feat of slaying Cao Cao. Ashamed, Guan Yu shooks his head and remains silent. Zhuge Liang, who already knows that Guan Yu would let Cao Cao go, goes on to only tease Guan Yu and says, Come on, General, don't be mad that we didn't all get up and greet you at the door for your epic feat. Guan Yu finally says, I have come to accept my death. Zhuge Liang asks, Why did Cao Cao not come by Hua Rongdao? Guan Yu answers, He did, but I let him go. Zhuge Liang then calls in the guard to drag Guan Yu out to have him executed. But Liu Bei quickly comes in and stops the show as he tells everyone that even though Guan Yu made a mistake, we need to give him a chance to make up for it, as the three brothers have sworn in the Peach Garden to die on the same day. So killing Guan Yu would be sentencing him to death and Zhang Fei to death as well. Zhuge Liang agrees and releases Guan Yu, and the whole side start to enjoy the night once again as they turn to their eye on the prize of the Jin province with Cao Cao's main forces evacuating the area. Aside from them, 
Zhou Yu, also wanting to get a share of this giant spoils of war for himself, as he reorganized his army following their victory at the Battle of Tribi. He aims to have them set out to march onto Nanjun immediately. As he readied his men for battle, Sun Qian arrives bearing gifts from Liu Bei to congratulate Zhou Yu on his stunning naval victory at Tribi. Zhou Yu asks Sun Qian, where is Liu Bei in camp now? And Sun Qian replies that Liu Bei has moved his camp farther west, at Youjiangkou, which was a clear sign that Liu Bei was preparing to attack Nanjun. So as Zhou Yu bids Sun Qian farewell, he tells him that he will bear return gifts personally and come see Liu Bei for himself. After Sun Qian took his leave, Zhou Yu summons Lu Su as he made plans to take 3,000 cavalry with him to ride to Youjiangkou to negotiate with Liu Bei personally on who had the right to take Nanjun. Lu Su asks Zhou Yu if he had a plan, to which Zhou Yu replies, If they play nice, then we talk it out. If they play dumb, then we just charge their unprepared camp with our 3,000 cavalry. On Liu Bei's side, Sun Qian returns and reports that Zhou Yu now plans to come personally to present return gifts. Liu Bei asks Zhuge Liang what he thinks that Zhou Yu want to come personally, as he has spent some time with Zhou Yu in the Wu camp, so Zhuge Liang would know him best. Zhuge Liang replies, Zhou Yu is here for Nanjun, so he will come with an army, and this is what we need to do, as he whispered a series of plans to Liu Bei. So when Zhou Yu arrives with Lu Su, along with their 3,000 cavalry, they were greeted by a small cavalry detachment led by Zhao Yun, who rode with them into camp. And inside the camp, the entire army and navy were at full alert and making final preparations for war. So Zhou Yu quickly abandoned any plans of a surprise charge into Liu Bei's unprepared camp. After dropping off his return gift, Zhou Yu, Lu Su, shared a feast with Liu Bei and Zhuge Liang as they discussed the future of Nanjun. Zhou Yu started the conversation and says, Seeing your army and navy are at full alert, are you guys preparing to take Nanjun for yourself? Liu Bei answers, We thought you might want to take it, so we thought we best prepare ourselves in case you need our help to take it. Now, of course, if you're not going to take it, then I would take it, as no one want to see it in the hands of Cao Ren. Zhou Yu laughs and replies, Of course I'm going to take it, as now we have finally beaten back Cao Cao's main force, and the Jin province is ripe for the taking. Liu Bei replies, Well, just because you won the Battle of Chibi doesn't mean you are guaranteed to beat Cao Ren so easily. What if you lose to Cao Ren? What happens then? Zhou Yu angrily replies, If I lose to Cao Ren, then you are welcome to take Nanjun yourself. But if I beat Cao Ren, then please stay out of my way. Liu Bei laughs and quickly agrees as he asks both Zhuge Liang and Lu Su to bear witness to this agreement. After Zhou Yu left, Liu Bei is a bit puzzled and asks Zhuge Liang why he made him make this bet with Zhou Yu, as Liu Bei is technically currently without any commanderies right now and residing basically as a glorified vassal under Liu Qi, who had the more legitimate claim to the rest of the Jin province. If Zhou Yu takes Nanjun and the rest of the Jin province, then Liu Bei will remain homeless. Zhuge Liang answers, Let Zhou Yu and Cao Ren beat each other up, and I promise you, we will end up sitting pretty in not just Nanjun, but the rest of the Jin province as well. Seeing that Zhuge Liang is confident, Liu Bei happily agrees to wait in place. Back in Zhou Yu's camp, not a moment can be lost as he quickly sends Jiang Qin, Xu Sheng, and Ding Feng with 5,000 men to cross over the river and begin their attack on Nanjun. When reports of this vanguard unit reached Cao Ren, Cao Ren debated if they should try to defend and outlast Wu in a siege or ride out to meet them. And one of his subordinates, Niu Jin, argues that currently the army's morale is low right after such a big defeat. If they don't ride out and show strength, the army might not be motivated to hold out in a long siege. So he volunteers to take just 500 men to ride out and meet them in battle in order to boost their army's morale. Cao Ren agrees and sends Niu Jin out with 500 men, who immediately gets in a duel with Ding Feng. After four rounds of exchanges, Ding Feng feigns defeat and rides back to escape. Niu Jin quickly orders his men to give chase, but they quickly fell into Wu's trap and become encircled by an overwhelming Wu force. 
Seeing that Niu Jin is now surrounded on all sides by Wu army, Cao Ren armors up himself and rides out with his elite unit of few hundred men as he just wanted to cut a path open for Niu Jin to escape and not get bogged down in a showdown outside the protected walls of Nanjun. So Cao Ren orders everyone else to remain inside as he charged out to save Niu Jin. But Cao Ren underestimated the Wu forces as he had only successfully cut through a path to the center of the Wu force to reach Niu Jin himself, but many of his fellow riders fell on this successful charge. And now he finds himself with just a few men, as technically he and Niu Jin are now both trapped within the Wu forces, and they no longer had the manpower to charge out of the blockade of men. Back inside Nanjun, Cao Ren's younger brother, Cao Chun, who we had first briefly discussed in our first historical episode in part 1, as the commander of Cao Cao's elite tiger and leopard cavalry, decided to disobey his brother's order as he rallied the entire army, including his elite tiger and leopard units, to ride out to rescue their commander. With this force, they were able to shatter the Wu encirclement as Cao Ren, Cao Chun, and Niu Jin overpowered the Wu generals and forced them across the river as they chased them away. To find out if Zhou Yu can actually take Nanjun from the capable hands of Cao Ren and the secrets behind the sealed strategy Cao Cao has left for Cao Ren, come back tomorrow as we will continue our lore series.